I bet when you watch the golf on TV and you see John Rahm, Dustin Johnson, other golfers get their wrist in this really flat or even flexed state the top of the backswing, you're wondering why they do that or how they do that. So today I'm going to use hack motion, which is a 3D sensor that measures your lead wrist. I'm going to talk through the lead wrist positions at the top of the backswing and how they move during the backswing to enable us to get in that position and how they should move ideally. There is obviously more than one way. I can see some golfers that have a more cup wrist at the top that flatten or flex it excessively more on the way down to get to a really strong impact position. And other golfers would be more flexed at the top and then they will move less into flexion on the way down or even into extension compared to where they are in the flexion state to get to the similar kind of impact position. There is definitely more than one way to skin the cat, but there is definitely some common threads that are used by most golfers. And in any golf swing, there are outliners, people that do it differently that are successful. And we're never ever, or I'm never ever, saying that you have to do it one way or this is the only way. For me, I want to give you the commonalities, the things that will work with most people, and that's important. Let's get stuck into measuring my wrists through the backswing and how they should move as well. Okay, let's just calibrate the hack motion. So I'll be able to share hopefully my screen with you. So let's get it connected up. So when we go through the calibration, this is the process we do. Simple as that. So you'll see here on the screen now it measures my wrist what I'm doing in live motion. Okay, so if I put that just on the floor there. So basically, what we're looking for really within the wrists, and we're looking at really flexion and extension today mostly, so basically this and this. So at address, if I take my grip, I've got about 20 degrees there of wrist cupping or extension at the start of the golf swing. Now, in a correct takeaway, so if I move the club back to about parallel, I'd want it to be near enough still 20 degrees. I'm 17 degrees there. So if it was 20 degrees, that would keep the club, what I would class as, in play. Okay? So right there, that's 24 degrees, 25 degrees, 26 degrees. So a little bit more here is 20 degrees. So that's maintaining the same wrist angle. So the wrist angle basically retains its extension throughout the first parallel position. There will be an increase in radial deviation. Okay, so as we start the swing, my wrists are actually what we call an ulna, minus 23. As I get back to here, that's about two degrees of wrist cock there. So I've got about 20 odd degrees of wrist cocking during that period, but the wrist extension elements are staying exactly the same. Now, as I work that swing to the top, I've now got seven degrees of wrist cupping there at the top. And, you know, for me, Anything probably between 0 and 20 would be pretty good, or 0 and 30 would be pretty good. I would definitely wouldn't want to see my wrists go more cut than they are at dress. I see some very good elite players get to about 24, 25 at the top, and then decrease it rapidly in transition. And that's the important thing to note. In transition, what we'd want to see is we're here. Those wrists go into that more flex state, and I'm into minus 6 there at that point. And as I go into impact, kind of minus six again there, but it went up to about minus 10. When I hit a shot in a minute now, we'll have a look at my key numbers. And again, I haven't got the perfect golf swing. So what we're trying to do really is maintain our wrist positions till about rib high in terms of wrist flexion and extension. Then let the wrist go into flexion, which is flattening the wrist, and then it flatten even more in the downswing and maintain that flat position all the way through impact. And then when I get past impact here, it will start to go back into extension. Let's try a shot. Okay, so I addressed 27 degrees at the top, 24 degrees and impact one. Not my best set of data, but what you will see if we look at the chart here is how that green arrow 
from the top of the backswing goes rapidly down to impact. That's exactly what I'd want to see. That shows the flexion increasing. Let's try another ball. <coughs> that one wasn't so great. First shot of the day as well. Much better hit. So 23 address, 23 at the top, and minus 12 at impact. Much more what I'd likely to see with guys that were elite players. And you'll see how the flexion rate decreases or goes sharper down to the impact area. Now, for example, using hat motion, if I wanted then to get my wrist flatter at the top, which, to be honest, I would like it to be a bit flatter at the top. Part of the reason I cross line is my wrist cupping. It certainly facilitates. I would hit then by a feedback and stick this in, let's say minus 35 and let's say 4 degrees. So give myself a little bit of leeway there. So if I go anything more than 4 degrees of cupped at the top now, the music won't make noise. So let's just show you that. Because I'm recording the screen, the volume is very quiet. That's making noise there nicely. Let's try hitting one. So six degrees at the top then, so rapidly changes by using this biofeedback. And that's essentially what I want to use this bit of the kit for. Measuring, understanding risks, but also being able to change risks through this. Now, if you don't have a kit like this, we can use various other things. One of the things I like golfers to use is just a simple T-peg. Now, if we stick this T-peg in that grip area there, like so, now, when I'm swinging the golf club now, try and get the tee peg point to the top of the swing. I'm going to move the swing so you can see what's going on. You see minus numbers there at the top of the swing straight away. And that one there during the swing, 11 degrees at the top. So just using the T-peg there got me to make a change in how my wrists would position themselves at the top of the swing. So the main thing we're really talking about with this video is understanding that the wrists maintain their position to the first kind of parallel ribcage area. Then they would go from there into a more flex state, increase the flex state ideally, and as they go through the ball then they go into this extension state as well, the kind of resetting state as they go through. That's absolutely fine. Hopefully that's made it a bit clearer how your wrist will move in the golf swing and gives you a better understanding of what you can practice with the T-peg to get your wrist bare. Again, to allow the shaft to change its dynamics in a transition area. So there you are, all the detail on this key lead wrist moves in the backswing. In terms of flexion and extension, we talked a little bit about radial, but basically the radial is a different area to talk about how much we should cock the wrist or uncock the wrist during the backswing and when it happens. Maybe that's another video for me to do with hat motion in the next few weeks. If it is, if you want to hear that video, or see that video rather, post down below and I'll get back to you with that one as soon as I can. Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for joining me at the Forest of Arden. If you haven't already followed or subscribed, please hit my low in those bottom corner and join me on my journey, and I'd love to help you lower your scores and improve your golf. See you again here soon.